Welcome everybody to the very first ever Green Club Meetup inaugural in San Francisco. This is going to be the monthly Green Club Meetup for at least the next 20 years. And I commit to that, to being here for that. And uh, so let's get started. Um, so first disclaimer for anybody watching on the video. There are no promises made here, so please don't sue anybody for future predictions. Just don't sue anybody. Just don't sue anybody, period. <laughs> How could anyone asking questions or anybody watching on video ask questions? That's the great thing about having this be the first one. I have no idea. Um, but if you know, then feel free to relay that question to me. Tweet at Green Plum. Tweet yeah. at Green Plum. Okay. Yes. Tweet at Green Plum. If you have a question, and we will get it up here, and we will, this is a live event, so we will just um, take them as they come, assuming our moderator there likes the questions. Actually, there's also a chat on uh, YouTube, so that's probably easier to post. Okay, them. chat on YouTube, change of plan. Chat on YouTube for questions. Okay. Okay. So, first <coughs> quick recap, the value prop of open source Greenplum database compared to the proprietary data warehouse products on the market. So I really believe this is the taking a, one of the commercial products from the, open, from the data, data warehousing world and bringing it open source and bringing the first one to be a, you know, a commercially supported open source offering in data warehousing and obviously eliminating vendor lock-in, uh, lowering your total cost of ownership, Having an open source project will attract more talent to the project, attract more people being involved, as we've seen in other open source projects. Um, leveraging Apache license, which allows for not only op uh, free to use software, but as well um, impl uh, explicit patent grants in the, in the license. As well as the ability for us to develop, this is the big one, ability to develop features faster and with community input. Because if you are trying to build the most popular product in a certain segment, and you have, let's say, 40 engineers, how can you possibly com compete with a worldwide collaboration of developers all contributing to a project with a free offering? It's very difficult. So this is the big value push to, to try and drive an open source project to be successful. Um, and then as well, looking at the core engine, Greenplum leveraging the Postgres core engine stack after, it must be now 20 years that Postgres has been out. And the amount of engineering going into the core DB engine, the core understanding of how to operate database systems at the root level is what Greenplum can build upon. And so I strongly believe that, a, that an MPP or a warehouse big data solution leveraging this has a huge advantage over building code from scratch because there's so much code, so many things to consider to go, go your own from scratch. It's very difficult. So leveraging Postgres as the core fabric of an open source data warehouse is a really important decision point. Okay, now, um, checking out the, the market space. There are open source databases. There's MySQL, there's Postgres. There are massively parallel shared nothing databases. We have Teradata, we have Vertica, Natiza, Redshift. Oracle we put as a hybrid because it's not truly scale out, although they've stretched it pretty much as far as it can go. And then let's say the traditional Microsoft SQL Server or Sybase running your single node proprietary database. But truly we believe that in the, the grid of open source and MPP scale out, Greenplum is standing alone in that quadrant and we're proud to be in that quadrant and taking that responsibility for the community. Okay, now the use, use cases. So why, why do you need a data warehouse? What does it do for the world? What does it do for industry? There's many use cases. This is a fun set of graphics just to illustrate some of the use cases. Fraud management. And I'll just, I've got to tell you a couple of just short bit, bits about each one of these things. Fraud management is a great use case for a data warehouse for an MPP because you can use in-database machine learning. In-database machine learning can be trained to recognize fraud. Based on historical transactions, you can put the data in the warehouse, you can show what was fraud, what was not fraud, and using the, the power of an MPP, you can train it to recognize fraud versus non-fraud. 
This is a solution that has been deployed <coughs> numerous times in commercial offerings of GreenPlum. Risk management. So in the risk management area, if you're thinking, let's say, about financial risk management, there are, there's an ever-increasing set of risks. Financial firms are doing more complex transactions, more transactions, and more complex transactions. And to be able to calculate the probability and the risk that they're undertaking is, is crucial to their survival. And they need to be able to calculate many different scenarios and to understand what is their position, what's their risk, and allow them to, to not be too conservative, but to keep the company safe. So this is another, another area where we're seeing a lot of traction. Cybersecurity. And cybersecurity, I'll say broadly, because there's so many different varieties of security. Um, simple examples, being able to store um, Windows server logs and recognizing patterns of why, are, why is Ivan's computer constantly talking to the finance department? That's an irregular anomalous behavior. That's the most trivial case, but it gets from trivial to PhD level analytics in all different specialty areas of cybersecurity and security. Um, on churn reduction, churn reduction is a classic use case in the, in the um, multiple segments. Um, simple to understand. You've got a telephone company, a cell phone company, and you want to understand which customers are at risk of jumping to another, to another uh, vendor, another provider. You can tell that from data because there are patterns in the customer's behavior that will indicate that they're not satisfied or that they're a candidate to leave. And that's something you can solve with big data. Um, and then four more. And I obviously can't cover every use case, but these are four more just to get your imagination going on the power of what you can do with analytics and with the data warehouse system that can do big data. Predictive maintenance. So predictive maintenance, this is an oil drilling rig. Now, if you want to replace equipment in the rig, you're going to replace it, you're going to take downtime, you're going to take cost to, to look at the equipment, you're going to take cost to replace the equipment. You want to do that at the optimal time. If you do it too early, you're wasting money. If you do it too late, you could have downtime and you could be losing valuable time to be drilling and getting oil. So being able to look at the sensors and make predictions and optimize this is financially rewarding to companies that operate big industrial equipment. That could be oil drilling, that could be jet airplanes, that could be um, trucks, any type of uh, expensive equipment that's being put out to use. Yield analytics, so semiconductor uh, manufacturers, in fact, I personally met some of the biggest semiconductor manufacturers globally, and you can use data to look at the output of the manufacturing and improve the yield. And when you improve the yield of the production, your profits go up. One of the interesting things one of the customers doing, and I don't have too many details that they shared, but they actually used the geospatial module of Greenplum to map and to analyze the wafer and to do calculations about the geography of the wafer, which is not actually a geography because it's really a wafer, but they took that code and leveraged it to analyze the wafer and to do sophisticated analytics to identify the patterns and, and optimize the production of their, of their semiconductors. Um, smart cars, we're seeing activity there. Cars can generate a lot of data. That data can be used, repurposed back into the car manufacturing business, into the car support business to, to provide features to customers and to, um, and to improve the experience. And lastly, you know, I came from, me and at least one other person in this room came from the internet company space. And you would think internet companies are very big fans of Hadoop, but I've been surprised in the last three years to see how many internet companies are adopting Greenplum for their advertising analytics. And I think that the high performance SQL that scales out allows them to do robust reporting that that is a, 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 a additional capacity to what they are also doing with Hadoop. So they tend to do a lot of um, ETL and, and data reduction in Hadoop and then reporting at the end once you take 100 petabytes of data, reduce it to one petabyte and then do a series of high performance analytics on the reduced data set. Okay. Um, now going beyond the use case to 
the building blocks below the use case that can be used for solving problems. So if you look at the building blocks, for example, we have geospatial. Geospatial is a building block. It comes with Postgres and Greenplum. Greenplum runs it at scale, and, and I think Postgres is unique in the geospatial ecosystem that's provided on Postgres. The geospatial community, there are conferences in multiple cities globally. There's a North American Open Geo conference. There's a European one. There's a global one. And most of it is centered around the Postgres community, which as a Greenplum community, we can adopt and leverage at scale. And, and it's something that it's, it's decades worth of work that, that, we, can, that we can benefit from. Um, the graph analytics is something we're just starting to promote in the Greenplum community, but with it's something that's being, that has been leveraged over, over the last few years by certain customers. And what this type of analysis you can do, um, for example, um, connected components in a, in a device. You can do, um, think about from a law enforcement point of view, you can be looking at connections between people, graphs of people. You can be looking at social networking. Um, there's, there's a number of problems which map to graphs. And the ability to, to store the data, the edges and the vertices, in the database and query it with a graphical model without having to get yet another technology just for graph data is an advantage. Um, can you go back? The, the clustering is, is, these are algorithms of unstructured learning where the database can find patterns and group things. So you can say, here are blogs. Let's group them into categories of content automatically and being able to do that with algorithms. Time series analysis, there are, there are libraries available for Greenplum to do time series analysis, classification to separate, for example, fraud versus non-fraud on transactions, regression, and, and text analytics. Text is the biggest form, the most quantity of unstructured data in the world is text. And being able to combine text data with structured data gives you a large um, coverage of the types of analytics you want to do and have it in a cohesive database that can scale. <clears throat> now, one of the, the key reasons why both Postgres and Greenplum are exciting is that they are extensible. So not only do they provide the core capabilities, but they provide the capability to extend the core database functionality. Now, if you look at the Postgres homepage and you read the About Me page, it says Postgres is an object relational database system. Now, for the most part, for an average user, Postgres and Greenplum are relational database systems. And, and, and the experience that you have with the database, with Greenplum, is a relational experience. However, there was a lot of thought put in when, when these databases were created that these are really object relational systems and, and, and for the purpose of being able to store in the catalog more information than just the tables and the views and indexes and being able to make it more extensible. So, so this database comes with user-defined types so you can create your own data types like geospatial data types such as geography but, or whatever data type is relevant to your domain. User-defined languages. So already in the community has been contributed Python, Perl, R, Java, so that not only SQL, but you can use these other languages to access your data and to do programmatic, um, programmatic manipulation of the data. Function returning sets and tables. So you can write functions which, which actually return entire data sets and then use them in queries. Um, function overload, user-defined aggregate. So aggregate Functions are things like sum, average, et cetera. And you can create your own user-defined aggregates to group things in different ways with your own custom logic. User-defined operators, operators. There are also um, the index system is extensible and in that you've seen different indexes been contributed over the years. So originally B-tree, we've seen um, GIST and GIN indexes get contributed about 10 years back, roughly. And then recently, in the last few years, the um, BRIN index was, was contributed to Postgres, which is a block range index similar to a zone map you could think of, like in, in some other systems. It's a, it stores information about the blocks, like the max and the min values in the index. So the index system is extensible. 
and can also be extended to operate on user-defined types. There is discussion in the community about potential additional extensibility, such as the storage layer itself, but I think there's still a lack of consensus on how this will evolve. Um, the two main arguments are full extensibility, similar to what we've seen in the MySQL world, where you've got an entire pluggable storage engine. And personally, having worked on those, what I found was that each storage engine was completely different. They implement their own logging, their own transactions, their own indexes. You don't get the benefit of the shared infrastructure. Um, in Postgres and Greenplum, we don't go really very far at all, but can we go some midway and get some shared services like logging and transactions, but still be able to customize different types of, the, of, of storage? That's to be determined in the future for the community. Um, also, the extension. So extensions are a recent, not too recent, extensions are a way to add functionality to the database. That we have extensions in Greenplum. We used to have a concept called GP package in Greenplum. We still have GP package, but eventually extensions will be in kind of the same as GP package. Um, think of things like cryptography. So we have PG Crypto, which is contributed there. So we can do encryption of data using an extension. We have, um, and again, mentioning geospatial, um, but the ability to add on your own modules. Uh, foreign data wrappers. So foreign data wrappers will be part of the future for Greenplum. They're part of the present for Postgres. And this allows a, a, a framework to, to incorporate external data as, a queryable, as queryable data sources in the database. So currently in Greenplum we have external tables. In the future we'll have foreign data wrappers, but the concept is to have an API so that you can write code to be able to process some outside data source like S3. So we have currently an S3 external plugin in Greenplum that allows you to do a query directly from the database but to fetch the data from S3, HDFS, um, another database like an ODBC database source. So this external data source, this federated data capability is another form of extensibility. And then lastly, PXF for Hadoop plugins. PXF is a part of an Apache project, which uh, there's a little bubble here. Talk to Roman if you're interested in this. And is a project that's part of Apache Hawk, and we're looking to see how that can be integrated into, into the Greenplum database and see how, what it offers is an, another abstraction layer for Hadoop-based plugins in order to access rich Hadoop data sources like Hive and HBase and other Hadoop-oriented data sets. Okay, and don't forget SQL, <laughs> right? There's been lots of talk about NoSQL, not just SQL, um, not, just yet. not just yet SQL, <laughs> but the reality is, is that SQL is a core capability of, of Greenplum, of Postgres, and of the expected behavior of a database, relational database, data management system. And there are tons of open source <coughs> data projects that are out there. If you go and search on, on the internet, you'll see hundreds of open source projects. But how many of them can do two things? How many of them can scale? And how many of them can do SQL? That's the hard part, right? If you can do data management with SQL and scale, that's where it gets hard. And, and, and a lot of them, even they do that, but then they say, but you can't update the data or you can't do this, or you can't do that. It gets hard when you try and bring the whole SQL relational database concept and do it at scale. And that's what we're trying to do here with, with Greenplum. Um, and in order to help us do that, we've got our GP Orca optimizer. And I'd said here with a little bit of tongue in cheek sarcasm, although it's actually true, 100 plus PhD years of work put into just the optimizer, not the database. The, op the database has more years of people working on it. But just the optimizer, this optimizer has 100 plus difference. years. Yes. This actually produced something. This actually produced something. Yes. Again? There's code. There's code. It's not just theory. It's not just theory. There's an optimizer. There's an optimizer that runs in production today in, in many different production data warehouses for critical purposes. And 100 plus years of PhD work. Here is a reference to the original paper, Orca Modular Query Optimizer. And I sat down with one of the original members of the Orca team and said, why is this a big deal? Why is Orca a big deal? The reason it's a big deal is because 
query optimization is complex, and to, to make it scale and to make it work on big data sets um, is, is difficult. And if you look at, for example, the approaches taken even in our, even in the single node Postgres, we did that. That was our original thing. We did that for five to seven years. There are, there are parts to it that become difficult as the complexity increases. And being able to create a modular system that can tackle the problem in small pieces through a framework makes the problem digestible, where, you can, where it can be solved easier. And it, so it's modular, it's grokkable. You can have a new developer work on Orca and not break it within a week or two. Whereas if you try to understand a optimizer that has state, where it's maintaining state through the process of creating a plan, the developer needs to understand the whole state and everything that's impacted as you move or else you could get the wrong results. But if you make it modular and say, hey, here's a transformation. This tra transformation goes from here to here. You don't need to know anything else about it. If you update this code, this transformation can improve. So by breaking it into components and making it modular, that allows the problem to be solved easier. It's test more testable. It provides high performance on complex data sets with partitions, with subqueries, with correlation. And it allows for rapid development. So this is a foundation that's, that's critical to bringing Postgres to the big data world. OK, now, not only are those the capabilities, but the second aspect to this is the openness of the product and the platform. So yes, this is an open source database, but it's also platform neutral. So how would you like it if we said, I'm going to create a really nice database, but you can only run it in one of these choices? That's cool, but uh, what if I don't want to run it there? Well, too bad, right? Um, OK. Now, not only that, but it's closed source. So what that means is that me, as a private company, is going to hire every developer who's going to write every line of code. And we're not going to use Postgres updates. So what we're going to do is, for the next 20 years, every advancement will be done by our 40 people. How far are you going to get with that? How quickly are you going to fall behind? How much technical debt are you going to build up? When are you going to be unsustainable? And, and if you look at other MPP databases that run, let's say, only on one of the public clouds that have private internal teams that, that have you know, small teams of people just maintaining that database, what's the future for that? It's going to be hard. So with us, our, our idea is to leverage the core Postgres engine, which gives us access to the R&D pipeline of, of, a, of a flow of, a, of an entire 20-year history of, of, of a community, as well as making the warehousing and MPP parts of it open source, and then saying, let's run this anywhere. Let's run this on your own hardware. Let's run it on virtualized hardware. Let's run it on Amazon. Let's run it on Google. Let's run it on Microsoft Cloud. That's the, prop, the value prop, is just run it anywhere and make it open source and base it on Postgres. OK, now on to the. Um, Roadmap part. So the, we went open source November of 15. We're now in October, October of 15. We're now in January of 17. If you've, if you've never done it before and taken a multi-hundred customer proprietary closed source product and then converted it to open source, it's a fun project. With a, it takes a lot of work. <laughs> um, Greenplum 5 will be the first release of Greenplum. That's an actual release that will be based off the open source code hosted at GitHub. So the exact code that you see in GitHub will be the code that's compiled into our commercial product, and it will be called Greenplum 500. I put here as a date, April, May, June-ish, um, because I'm not exactly sure yet when it will hit, hopefully closer to the April-ish part of it, but maybe closer to the June-ish part. Remember slide number one. Um, so. In addition to this, what does it have? So yes, it was a big effort to, to, to convert this whole platform over to the open source, to GitHub, to, to bring the, the testing out into the open source, the test cases out to the open source. It's also where we made the decision point and said, yes, this will be based on Postgres. 
we will be bringing in the, the, the future versions of Postgres. We will be working with our team to reorganize how we look at this, to refactor some of the code, to make it easy so that we can port the Postgres bits in. Um, and in this first release, it will have the first uh, grouping, which is A2 to A3. Now we did try initially doing upgrades by doing one commit at a time. That was too difficult because it's too hard for anyone to follow. Right? You're doing one commit, one commit, one commit. We decided, okay, let's take all of one version and port that in in group. It makes for a cohesive block that people can understand. So this one will have A3. Now we could wait and say, let's wait till we get to 10.0 and then we'll release it. But no, we're gonna do this as we go. We're gonna bring this as a version. It's got A3, it's got refactored to support future upgrades. It's got a bunch of other stuff. It's got <coughs> new, new data types. We have the JSON data type now. We have improved XML data types. We have the, uni the universally unique identifier data type. We have the raster geospatial data type. We have a new dispatcher. So we have an asynchronous version of the dispatcher which doesn't block and which makes for dispatching to large clusters better. And we have a refactored based analyze from Postgres which improves the analyze speed by, a f by one order of magnitude um, to, to the previous versions of Greenplum. C again, see slide one about the disclaimers. So yeah. Why 8.3, why not 9? Why, why not 8, why 8, 3, why not 9? The answer yeah. is yes and yes. 8.3 and 8.4 and 9, but first 8.3. We're doing this linearly, and we're going to release. Is, is we're there gonna something magic about that particular version you decided to pin the first uh, version to? It's the next one. So we were okay. previously on A2. So next is A3. Now, we think our velocity is going to go up. So it took us, if you count the date, from October, it took us a year and a half to do one version. But we think our velocity will, you know, I'd be willing to say our velocity will go up by five times quickly. And then and go from there because and we're refactoring code as we go. And maybe you can help me. Uh, I recall somewhere in the Postgres uh, versioning there was a pretty significant change in file formats or other infrastructure that caused them to. Go ahead. That that caused them to, um, or that might lead to a uh, challenge for people. Yeah. Right. So the question was, um, is there a file format version change? In, in Postgres, and the answer is that 8.3 was the last time that Postgres team, at least according to the people in my company, and I believe it's pretty true, and the audience can confirm me, but um, 8.3 was the last time that the Postgres team allowed the project to have binary on disk file format changes. After 8.3, the contract in Postgres is you're not allowed to change the on disk format of data. So once we release five, the data format will be consistent from there on because Postgres gave that contract. But before 8.3, the contract wasn't there. So coming from our proprietary version of Greenplum, uh, um, it, was, it was different. So this, this will be a milestone, a baseline where on this format is consistent thereafter. That will simplify migration in the future. That will simplify future migration. Um, so this is the, a foundational release and will form the beginning of an increased velocity and, and, and productivity that we can continue to, to, to build upon. Okay, looking at road mapping. So we get five out the door, it's a huge milestone, it brings the community together. There's open source users out there and I'll talk about some of the open source successes in a second. But there, if you're a genuine open source user right now, how do you do it? Until we release five, what you have to do is you have to take GitHub, take the latest code, pick out a version of the, the you know, where you want to you want to download the code, build it from there, and there's no promise or guarantee that that's part of a consistent version or there'll, there'll be patches or that it's, it's, um, it's not clear that that marks any milestone. You're, you're kind of on your own, and I know people have done it and they're doing it because, because it provides value to them even now. But once we get to five, you've got a version, and that version is something you can stand on, that the community can stand on, and then we can start building from there. Now post five, that's when the fun really gets going because now we're gonna start accelerating and doing more things. So here's some of the things that are, we're thinking about, that I'm thinking about, that I've heard people thinking about, and that, that people are gonna be working on. 
the journey to PostgreSQL 10, 10x plus. So they haven't released 10 yet, but 10 is coming. I've, I, I underst am understanding that 10 is just a number. So it was decided to call it 10 because it's the next number and it's time to change from 9 dot whatever to 10. It's not a foundational change. It's just the next one. So don't be afraid about 10. We are on the journey to bring all the Postgres versions into Greenfilm. We're not going <coughs> to wait until we get all the way there to create releases. We're going to create releases as we go and create a stable enterprise platform for users so that as we go, as this journey is going on together, people can do their business on the platform in a stable way and grow with us as we grow and go to the later versions of Postgres. Um, as part of that, we will be, there will be people working on enhanced ways to upgrade a cluster. So if, you, if we want to get more velocity, if we want to make more changes, if we want to, to make the database better, how can we do that if people can't seamlessly, quickly, fast, take in large changes of code quicker? And in order to do that, to support that, we need to have work and have people putting focus and energy on the process of upgrade and making that easier, making that better. That's going to be a, a priority. The S3 connector was introduced in last year, and we're just starting to see that S3 has been standardized. People around the world are using S3. There are you know, Dell EMC storage products. There are Google service offerings. There are open source things from uh, OpenStack, all leveraging S3 protocol. And so being able to open up our S3 and ensure that we can have green plum reading from all these different sources brings a wide variety of data into, into GPDB. Multi-cloud platform support. So the promise from green plum is that this project is not tied to one platform. Now, as there are at least three major cloud platforms right now that are quite popular, we're going to be doing a lot of testing. I'm going to be doing a lot of testing in my team to validate the performance and load and the settings that are optimal in these different systems. So if we want to run on Microsoft Azure, what settings would you want? How do you deal with the network? They built custom and proprietary networks in order to create Microsoft Azure. How do you optimize that? That's something we want to help the customers with and not let them have to figure that out themselves or help the users and add that to community knowledge. Um, resource queues. Resource queues have room to be improved. We'd like to see, I'd like to see, and I'm saying I because I don't want to speak behalf of a company right now, but I would like to see resource queues being able to pin percentage of utilization to a number. Say this queue should be able to use 20% CPU instead of the priority. Also like to be able to see that the resource queues be triggered on, on factors other than the user group. Can you trigger the resource queue based on what application the query came from or other input factors? so that there's more differentiation on which queue things go into. Um, well, replication on the segment. So when we built Greenplum high availability, Postgres wasn't providing a project for um, replication that we felt comfortable using. Now, log replication in Postgres is, is very well respected, very stable, and we are eager to bring that into the fold of Greenplum in order to leverage segment-to-segment -segment mirroring. That will be the foundational feature, most likely, of a Green Plum version 6, which will now be based on a, on a more open standard of, of mirroring that the wider community can, can collaborate on easier and that, that can take away specified capability that we don't need to be specializing in Green Plum when we can leverage Postgres-style capability there. On the management utilities, I wrote third generation because we had two more generations before this. <laughs> we built management utilities in Bash in 2005. We built management utilities in Python in 2009. We need to build management utilities which are more responsive to cloud environments now. Um, cloud environments where machines are independently managed and they can be um, controlled where it's not controlled directly through, let's say, a driving script where there are demons that bring up the machines, more of how people are used to managing systems. And so the third generation of management utilities is something that I think we need to, to, to work on. 
we, we talked briefly about GP Orca previously, so that's going to continue to be a focus and to provide a core capability of query optimization and query execution in Greenplump. And the second part to that is the just in time clone generation framework. So we will release the first version of that in five. And as we were saying before this talk, this will enable, um, as you execute a query, it will just in time generate optimized machine code to accelerate those queries. If you enable it, it'll be available as a, as a session level setting. So you can turn it on and off for each query, depending on what you want to do. If you're running a very long running aggregation job, this will be very helpful to speed up the query. In the future, it'll be helpful for many more things. And, and ideally, it could be determined to, to kick in and turn on automatically. But for starters, we're enabling it as a manual switch that you can turn on at the query level to accelerate queries and that it will have performance benefits for you. Um, talking about Apache Madlib incubating, we will have our next meetup next month will be focused just on Apache Madlib, so please tune in for that one. But at a high level, Apache Madlib has maybe an eight year history of doing machine learning in database. In addition to machine learning, some of the focuses that that project is, is working on this year, I've seen activity around graph algorithms, more advanced graph um, functions, as well as doing investigations into deep learning and image recognition. So broadening the scope of their original mission and providing more in database analytics. Back up and restore second generation. So as far as the second generation, um, we have, I have ideas, we have ideas, other people have ideas. How can we make it backup? You've got a big database. By definition, it's gonna be hard to do a backup because it's big. And where are you gonna put the data? You need some big place to store it, right? And how do you check deltas? There's a lot of challenges for big backups. <coughs> but there's opportunities to make it faster, to make it better, to make it everything. And so that's an, that's an area to, that, that people who are interested should be, there's opportunities to work on. And, and we're gonna improve in this area. Uh, short query performance, so mixed workloads. Greenplum is well known for, for analytics queries and long running queries. We're not talking about doing a online shopping system with Greenplum, but, but the ability to create a data warehouse system with mixed workloads where you've got high concurrency of people running analytic queries and also people doing lookup queries and having them all operate in one system. Now the resource queue work will help there, but also Optimizer work, query execution work, dispatch work, all of these things come together to be able to provide the responsiveness to short running queries and the throughput for long running queries. Think of an OS. An OS needs to prioritize user facing responsiveness over background jobs so that when you go onto your laptop, you don't think it's hung, right? When you click a button, you expect it to return. So the OS will prioritize user facing above long running demons. Same thing in the database. We need to prioritize these short running queries and give the responsiveness so it seems like it's alive, even though it is alive, but it could be churning through this huge workload and you don't want to put that in front of somebody's quick little query and they say, hey, I'm just running a quick query. Let me get my response. Um, Hadoop ecosystem support, we talked about that a little bit. Um, it's not as dramatically important today as it was in 2011 but it's still important. And there's a lot of data living in data lakes and in HDFS, and we want to make it as easy as possible. Greenplum is not a data lake, it's a database for big data. There's a lot of good data in a data lake or in a Hadoop farm that we wanna get into the database that the user wants to get to, to process and to do analytics, analytical SQL. So having interactivity, having the ability to reach out and pull data in and to get data to, to, to consolidate into a warehouse for computation is, is a good feature. And lastly, foreign data wrappers, which come from Postgres, will be something starting to look this year into bringing that into Greenplum so that we can leverage all the foreign data wrappers built in the Postgres world and get access to those types of external data in Greenplum. Question, Greg. Uh, so things like foreign data wrappers, do you guys have to do some work to make it parallelizable? Question is, do we need to do work on foreign data wrappers to make them parallelizable? The answer is yes, uh, and that's going to be part of the project. So we're going to be bringing in, after we get 5.0 out the door, 
we're going to be looking at 6.0, starting to work on 6.0. The cadence of releases are going to increase. The cadence of Postgres up here are going to increase. We're going to be looking at the foreign data wrappers, how to bring them in, how to make them parallelizable, and then moving our existing external table code over to the foreign data wrapper protocol, and then looking at the other foreign data wrapper protocol uh, implementations out there, ODBC, JDBC, IBM, DB2. Um, all these different people have contributed foreign data uh, plugins. Let's get those and make them available to our community. So I have a question. Question from Caesar. On the idea of ecosystem support, we already support HDFS files, right? So we already support. We already support HDFS. So through, through external tables, I mean, we support par we, Parquet. And we support other. Parquet. So, so what, what else is left? So what is the, what is the, what is the? Well, okay, so, on, else. so on the Hadoop, <laughs> there's some <laughs> interesting things. Um, Firstly, um, the, the catalog. So Hadoop has a catalog. So will it, be, will it make it nice and, and, and convenient for you to be able to just reference the table name by the Hadoop catalog name and have it locate the files? Will you, what about being able to read ORC files? Right now we support Avert and Parquet. What about the ability to support, to read in from Hive or HBase? What about the ability to create plugin architecture where people can contribute their own standalone jar files that can process and, and, and access different Hadoop data structures that we may not be aware of and not have to interfere with the core engine of the DB. Um, so that, these are things that other people have done and that we're looking to see how we can take advantage of. Um, additionally, the question is, is Spark meaningful in a green plum world? Now, there are certainly a lot of data scientists that like Python. They like to code in Python. They don't, they don't like SQL. They like to code in, in a workflow of Python, you know, linear uh, data frame kind of model. Um, so I don't know if you call that Hadoop or you call that Spark or if those are the same or they're different, but um, there is, there is um, it's something to explore. And as people contribute code, it's something that we'll be taste giving a trial to, and if people leverage it, if people like it, I'm not sure how it will go. Either people will say, hey, I'd love to run a Spark job from in Greenplum, and then put the data back into Greenplum. So you've got your data in GPDB, you run a Spark job, you put it back in Greenplum, maybe that'll be cool. Or maybe they'll say, well, why should I mix and match these things? If I have Greenplum, I'll use Madlib. It has all the same features, it's just a different access model. So maybe it's just too complex and confusing to mix two different systems. So we don't know. But if people love it, we can we can support it as long as we, we keep the data management in Greenplum, we can provide extensible ways to access it. Okay. Now onto the Greenplum open source community. So we bootstrapped this community from ground zero at Postgres Europe conference in Vienna October fifteenth. Ground zero. We didn't have a clue what an open source, what we, let's not say that there weren't people in the team that didn't have a clue, but as a group, we didn't have a clue what it meant to build an open source community. But we're doing it one step at a time and putting one foot forward, and, and we're growing it from scratch, piece by piece, from the grassroots organically. This event is part of that. This will be the first meetup, like I said, of a monthly meetup for 20 years. Um, now, this is the graph of the uptake of the community. It doesn't really mean anything. I just thought it was a good graph. <laughs> but um, best case, GitHub. So GitHub <laughs> has been extremely helpful. It's a wonderful software. Whoever, if it's a public company, you should invest in it. Um, I don't think it is public. We have 310 project watchers. We've got 1,700 project stars. We've got 530 forks. We've got 111 contributors. 1,200 PRs, of which only 34 open, meaning that the other almost 1,200 have been processed already. We've got 190 GitHub issues, of which 105 have been resolved. So from ground zero, we bootstrapped this thing, and we're making it go. Um, the mailing list, we started mailing lists from scratch with no, nobody on it. We've now got 269 subscribers on the users list, 220 subscribers on the developers list. In the last 30 days, there's, we're on pace of about 100 emails a month. So not so much that it kills your inbox, but enough to keep you busy. <laughs> um, we, have, we didn't have this on day one. 
we now have released the same test suites we used to test Greenplum from our commercial point of view are now open source. So people can take the same test suites, the same test cases, they can run them, and they can validate if, if changes have, have made a difference. One of the things you'll see in the next slide is how do we orchestrate that and how do we communicate as a team to see in a community how the, how the um, one more thing back there, what, uh, how the tests are going. 19, we've created a YouTube channel on Greenplum. We've got 19 videos there. I would expect to see a big, massive increase in YouTube videos this year. I think YouTube's a great channel for publishing content. Everybody watches YouTube. And so watch the Greenplum YouTube channel, subscribe to it, and you're going to see a lot of cool videos. Um, shout outs for community. And, and if you have a shout out, email me that of what you want to shout out about of how you've used open source Greenplum. Um, one shout out goes to the Apache Big Top project. So it's a top level project in Apache that does packaging of binaries. So you can go to Apache Big Top now and download Greenplum open source binaries there which are not provided from the Greenplum project itself. And they combine that with other binaries from other open source projects. Big shout out from Big Top Contributor. In fact, you can even download Greenplum for PowerPC. In <laughs> fact, PowerPC is supported. So <laughs> even <laughs> platforms that are not commercially supported, you can get um, binaries for, for other platforms. So check out Apache Big Top. Another shout out goes to our, <coughs> our partners and friends in China. So Alibaba which is the e-commerce giant founded by Jack Ma out of China, has launched very successfully. We've got a great video, unfortunately. It's only in Chinese. I'm working to get it translated, but it's, it's very hard to understand if you don't speak Chinese, of the, of the joint announcement between us and Alibaba where, we, where they released cloud database hybrid DB based on open source Greenplum. In other words, the project's code is based on open source Greenplum. They added their own secret sauce to it. They put it in Alibaba Cloud called Aliyun. You can see it on aliyun.com. And they're now offering their product based on Greenplum in the cloud, which is essentially a competitor to Amazon Redshift. Um, looking at the next steps for the community. So um, the meetup, we're going to be doing uh, pizza and networking, followed by a talk every, every month followed by Q&A and bring your questions. So if you have any Greenplum questions, there'll definitely be experts there. So bring your questions to the meetup. We're gonna be hosting it in San Francisco on a monthly basis. We're looking for volunteers to host it in other cities. If you're seeing this remotely, um, Sao Paulo, New York, wherever you are, reach out to help get help to organize a, a community locally. Uh, we're also gonna be doing a virtual meetup every month, which will be available through some sort of a technology for, for interactive meetings online. So it'll be a monthly meetup. The next San Francisco meetup, we're gonna be going a deep dive into Apache Madlib and what types of analytics are coming out um, new in that project. And then the next meetup on the, on the virtual meetup will be a, a history and future of GP Orca Optimizer where we're gonna have the founders of GP Orca discussing deep dive on optimization, query optimization. These are all PhD researchers who who have worked at different companies and who know the whole market and sphere of, of query optimization. Um, after we get 5.0 released, a very interesting aspect will be is that we're gonna have a new branch called 5.0 Stable. So what we're gonna do is the master branch is gonna carry on and master will become the foundation for Greenplum 6, but we'll now have a 5.0 Stable branch where we can be doing community releases off of 5 that have bug fixes and minor features so that if you deploy open source Greenplum, you can start tracking a stable branch in addition to the active developed branch for the next major. Um, binaries, let's talk about that. As I mentioned, Apache Big Top has it, but you know, I personally am open to seeing some basic binary capability in the Greenplum project. If anybody is interested, let me know and we can talk about it. Um, and then, Pull requests, so we, I believe, do we have an automated pull request pipeline right now? Yes. We do, is it public to the open world? Yes. We have, okay. So just checks with some of our experts in the audience. We have now already a pull request pipeline. So when you create a pull request on GitHub, it'll automatically run the code and the test and give you the results to show if the test or failed and what failed so that you can see what's wrong. So you don't have to guess and you don't have to wait for somebody at the sponsor company to validate your code. 
that's a huge productivity thing. And then other ideas for growth. Again, we're trying to grow this community. Reach out to anybody in the community that you know. Reach out to me and come with your ideas. We're gonna grow this thing. Okay, next events. As I mentioned, next month here, um, newest Madlib features online. Still figuring out which technology we're gonna use and how to get the invite out, but the Orca, GP Orca deep dive history and future. And next Q&A. So let's take just if there's any couple questions and then break off so that we can take a break and, and network locally here. So yes. So I was wondering if you want to touch on, on how important the, the, the gem file connector is because with so much OLTP data, it, it can flow into green plant. Gotcha. So the question was about a gem fire connector. So Gemfire Connector, what that means is there's a open source project called Apache Geo. It's also sponsored by the same company, Pivotal, which sponsors the Green Plum Database project. Uh, in a sense, sponsored, although it's slightly different because it's an Apache project, so Apache is a sponsor, but a lot of the contributors come from Pivotal. Um, Apache Geo is a in-memory grid. So what it provides is the ability to um, do transactions in memory. So it can do, it, it has a transaction log, it can do reliable transactions, it can do replication across a wide area network, it can support extreme high concurrency. It's a key value store, it's not a SQL database. It's a cache, it's a cache and an in-memory transaction system. Altogether it's called an in-memory grid. Now, an in-memory grid has a very different feature set than a data warehouse. And given that our sponsor company has um, developer interest in both of these projects, we are doing some value add in terms of the interoperability between them. But that project is a commercial software project and it's not an open source project. Um, so I don't want to talk too much about it because it's a commercial offering. But um, the Apache Geode project, check out that project. It's the most, I would call that project the most enterprise ready, robust, <coughs> in-memory data grid that exists. So compared to Oracle, compared to anybody, if you just want to do an in-memory grid, Apache Geode, it's, it's got the, the highest reliability for a real-time in-memory grid. So check it, check it out and imagine what you could do with that combined with the warehouse. That's what we're thinking about inside our company and a commercial offering on top of the open source. Maybe one more question. Anybody got one more question? Yes. So your roadmap bullets fell into two categories. There were Postgres merges of plant releases and uh, also like Green Plum specific features. I didn't see any anything on um, backporting of features from Postgres, like the other Postgres versions. So like JSON, I think, you know, is backported. Do you have any so the question on? was about backporting specific features from Postgres like JSON um, and <coughs> And looking at the roadmap, and there's the Postgres stuff, and there's the Green Plum value add features. So let me just explain on a high level the strategy here. So from a Postgres back point of view, back port point of view, we've got a very clear strategy, which is to take it linearly. So we're not crossing the streams. We're not saying, this is what we used to do, actually. We used to say, oh, there's a really cool feature in Postgres over there. Let's go and get just that. We stopped doing that because we got serious about Postgres, and now we're doing it linearly. So we're getting every feature as we go through the versions in, in a march. And so JSON will be there. Um, it just so happens that somebody else who is making a business, and I'll give a shout out to uh, ToroDB in Spain, making a Mongo protocol, a Mongo adapter to Greenplum. So you can talk to it like Mongo, but behind the scenes, the storage Greenplum needed JSON. So they proactively backported JSON, submitted to community. It was safe and fine. We accepted it. So we have JSON now in Greenplum. But as a generic march, we're moving through all the Postgres features in order as the most efficient way to get everything. And then in addition to that, we're looking to see what are the features we need to contribute as sponsors of this project in order to that, that make it different from a warehouse point of view than an OLTP single node database point of view. How do we need to make this whole thing work for the end user 
as a data warehouse. And that's where we're adding different features and our own features to, to make this project successful. So thanks everybody for coming to the meetup, for watching the meetup, and see you next month. Thank you.